Opak Ruoth Nusai Ogwedu. Hallelujah. Welcome to a brand new study as we are in our about our eighth or ninth part of Old Testament survey. The joy of the joy and the relevance of the Old Testament for believers today. And I just want to say to all of you students at Elam uh, Theological Institute, Karibu. And as we get into our study today, Quom un jogo moye, we watch nyesai oti and gimau. Amen. Let's trust the Lord to change us and transform us as we get into his word today and to prepare us to be the kind of leaders that that will glorify him and bring praise and glory and honor to him. And so would you pray with me now as we get ready to to get into uh, further into the Old Testament survey and specifically further into our our overview of the book of Exodus. Let's let's pray right now. Walem, Heavenly Father, be glorified in our lives today. Be glorified in this study. Have your way. Come, Holy Spirit. Be Roho Maler and change us and transform us and give us your heart to disciple the nations, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Exodus chapter 20. Let's read through uh, the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20. Because the Ten Commandments is, is in part the heart and soul of the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 20 beginning in verse 1. Then God spoke all these words saying, and of course he's giving them to Moses, I am Yahweh your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Why does he say that? Because they lived in Egypt for 430 years and the Egyptians had many gods and Yahweh was bringing the people of Israel into the land of Canaan and the Canaanites worshipped many gods. And so God is saying they are no gods at all. You cannot, you must not, you must never worship any other gods. Isn't it interesting that Satan in the wilderness temptations and tests tried to get Jesus to bow down and worship him. All all gods come from Satan other than, of course, the true and the living God. You shall have no other gods before me. Verse 4, you shall not ever make for yourself an idol like the Egyptians or the Canaanites or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. Why would he say that? Because the pagans had gods for every place uh, on earth, the sky, the water, uh, over agriculture, etc. You shall not, verse 5, worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Not jealous as in uh, jealousy of human beings, but jealous from the standpoint of of the well-being of his people, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. That is, of those who rebel against him continually. We've already gone over the consequences of sin and how they affect uh, the third, up to the third and fourth generations. But showing chesed, to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not ever take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. That is to treat it as unholy. Uh, it's not just a swearing, but it's taking the name 
of the Lord and treating it in a common manner, in an unholy manner, in an unworthy manner. He says in verse 8, remember the Sabbath day, not just remember in your minds, but enter into the covenantal nature of the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That one day a week especially is to be a holy day. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day, verse 10, is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. Because they would be tempted to say, okay, we won't do any work, but we'll make, we'll make our servants do the work instead. And God says, no, you shall not do that. For in six days, verse 11, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Does that mean he didn't have any activity? No, we find Jesus teaching that God is always at work. He doesn't rest in the sense of he's not active in our lives, but he stopped working in the area of creation to give us an example, to set the example for us, not to be slaves. Remember the Jews were in Egypt. They were slaves. They worked seven days a week. There was never a day of rest. There was never a day of worship. And God says, I cease from creation. I did all my work in creation in six days. I rested the seventh day, not because I need to rest because he's God, but because he's giving them an example to follow in his footsteps, to follow in his path, if you will. He says, um, he says in verse 11, for in six days, Yahweh made the heavens and the earth the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, Yahweh blessed the, the Sabbath day and made it holy. Verse 12, honor your father and your mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Paul refers to that um, in Ephesians. You shall not murder you shall not steal i'm sorry you shall not murder uh, verse 14 you shall not commit adultery jesus takes the the prohibition against the act and goes even deeper to show the spiritual intent of the law you shall not steal you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor over and over in the new testament we have um we have the call and the command not to criticize someone, not to judge them behind their back. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything, anything that belongs to your neighbor. What God is doing is trying to rid us, the spiritual intent of the law is to rid us of envy and jealousy and all attempts uh, to make us dissatisfied and discontent and co competitive with others. And thus ends the teaching on the Ten Commandments. Now, in the notes, I want to just mention a little bit about the Ten Commandments those laws that Yahweh gave the Israelites were designed to help them to be a holy nation. That's in Exodus 20 through 24. First, to reflect God's nature, to reflect his holiness, to reflect his character. Why is that important to mention that? Because the Egyptian gods and the Canaanite gods were immoral. And they are completely different than Yahweh, who is utterly moral and pure and holy, and he wants his people to be like that. So they were the, the Ten Commandments and all the laws that God gave his people were to reflect first his holiness and secondly 
that they would not become corrupted by the pagan nations and instead be God's witness to them in their lost condition. That's what God has always been a missionary God. He's always had a heart for the pagans, the idolaters. Abraham was an idolater. He drew him out of Ur of the Chaldees and brought him to himself. God is a missionary God. Right at the beginning, you see his heart for the nations in drawing out a people to himself, making them holy, and then giving them his beautiful uh, Torah so that they could disseminate it out throughout the earth. But they failed. Jesus came and he succeeded, then sent his disciples out again so that we would succeed and get the gospel out to the nations, to the nations. I pray that God will raise up some of you students to go beyond the borders of Kenya and to preach the gospel throughout the continent of Africa and maybe even beyond that. Get a heart for the lost, loved ones. Let God break your heart for the lost. Don't just take the gospel for yourself and just for your church, but get his heart for the lost. Get his heart for Kenya. Get his heart for Uganda and Somalia and Sudan and Egypt and Chad and Niger and all the world. Pray that God would give you the nations. Amen. Get a heart for the lost. Get a heart for the drunkards. Get a heart for the prostitutes. Get a heart for the down and out. Get a heart for those who have grown cynical towards the church because they see uh, so much corruption and so many ministers. But get a heart for the lost. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Be Roho Maler. Uh, hallelujah. Lord, give us the lost. Give us the lost. Give us the lost. Break our hearts for what breaks yours. Ruin us for the things of this world and ignite our hearts to be on fire for you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The Holy Spirit is moving. The Holy Spirit is moving. He's moving on our hearts. He's breaking up the fallow ground and he is not allowing us to be satisfied with just a little bit. He wants fruit. Jesus wants us to bear fruit for him. Everywhere we go, everywhere everywhere we go. Being his witness at the store to our relatives, to our neighbors, everywhere we go, everything that we do. That's why we're studying this, loved ones. That's why the, the, the Lord has opened up the door for you to come into Elam Theological Institute so that you can bear fruit for him, so that you can disciple others, so that you can share what you're learning from the Word of God into the lives of others. Tell them that they were created in God's image and likeness with a purpose and a destiny and a reason for living. And that the only way they can enter into that is through a relationship through Jesus Christ. There's hope for them. There's forgiveness for them. Amen. Just like God has brought us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. One commentator, Samuel Schultz, who wrote a Old Testament survey, explains the, the Ten Commandments and all the laws that God gave Israel this way. He says that the distinctive feature of the Decalogue, or the Ten Commandments, is evident in the first two commandments. In Egypt, many gods were worshipped. The plagues had been directed against the Egyptian gods 
in whom the people trusted, in whom Pharaoh trusted. God brought those gods tumbling down, just like he did Dagon with the Philistines. You know, that statue that fell and, and broke. The inhabitants of Canaan were all, also polytheistic. That is, they worshipped many gods. Israel was to be distinct and unique as God's own people, characterized by a singular devotion to God and God alone. Not even an image or likeness of God was permissible. Consequent, consequently, idolatry became one of the worst offenses in the religion of Israel. Now we understand why God takes idolatry so seriously. Religion in Egypt and Canaan involved incest, widespread sexual immorality, intermarriage of brother and sister, prostitution, and to appease the gods that they worshipped, child sacrifice. This is something that, that Jeremiah rebukes Judah for, child sacrifice, because they, they began to worship Baal and Molech and Ashtaroth. And all of these gods required child sacrifice to appease them. But God would never allow that. That is why we have the exhortation against turning away from him. And so Schultz rightly argues concerning the Torah, remember the teaching or the instruction of Yahweh, that simple obedience to these moral, civil, and ceremonial laws would distinguish the Israelites from the surrounding nations. Which brings us to this point. How do we interpret the moral, the civil, and the ceremonial laws in our context today? That becomes the chief challenge to most Christians and most Bible teachers, what do we do with the ceremonial laws, the dietary laws, the civil laws? What about the moral laws? Are they relevant for us today? Well, let me try to explain this in a bit of an overview. First, the dietary laws, you know, you can't eat certain, certain foods. They were given to the Israelites for their health but also because many of the pagan ways of eating were dedicated to the worship of their gods. That's the reason why. Israel was to be a distinct, holy people to the Lord. Let me read that in Exodus 19 and verses 5 and 6. We read that, I think, last time. Exodus 19. This is... Um, Exodus 19, 5 and 6 is the foundation for, for the giving of the law and the, and the foundation uh, for the, just for the whole religion of Israel. Uh, Exodus 19, 5 and 6. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples for all the earth is mine and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation these are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel and now through Jesus Christ the Bible tells us that we Gentiles are now a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Isn't that marvelous? Uh, I believe it's Revelation 5, 9 and 10, and 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10. Now, because the civil, the ceremonial, and the dietary laws pertain to Israel as a theocratic nation in a new land, 
they so that they would avoid pagan ways, such laws no longer pertain to people living in the new covenant because we're Gentiles, we're not Jews. And that's why, my friends, Jesus declared all foods clean in Mark chapter 7 and verses 18 and 19. And it's why he gave Peter the dream of eating unclean foods in Acts chapter 10. Although the clear purpose of that dream remains, don't consider the Gentiles to be unclean. So it's really a both and rather than an either or. He gave them the vision and he reiterated what he already said in Mark 7. Arise, Peter, eat. Peter says, no way, Lord. I've never, nothing unclean has ever touched my mouth. What God has cleansed no longer consider unclean. That pertain to the food, but even deeper it pertain to the Gentiles. And Peter wouldn't even eat with the Gentiles. Peter, it took Peter a while to get into his heart the commission of the Lord to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. You know what? Peter was was the one of the two great apostles, and even Peter was so stubborn and set in his ways, it took a trance for the Lord to get him to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. I'm laughing because not because I'm I'm laughing necessarily at Peter, but I'm just reminded of how hard 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 headed I can be and even how hard-hearted I can be, and how slow I can be. It reminds me of the fact that I need, sorry, I got a pen here in my pocket and it's bothering me, I've got to take it out. I need, just like you need, we all need sanctification. We all need uh, the Holy Spirit to change us and transform us just because we love God, just because we're, we're saved doesn't mean that the Lord doesn't need to continually cleanse us and get stuff out of our lives. And Peter was, I just can't stop laughing. Peter was a great apostle, but he would not, he would not even eat with Gentiles, let alone share the gospel with them. So God had to do something supernatural. Not that he's saying he has to do something supernatural in us every single time he wants to change us. Peter is an example of us needing to say, Lord, search my heart. Lord, change me. And to be willing to have someone else correct us and speak into our lives. Are you willing to do that, loved ones? As iron sharpens iron, so does one man <coughs> sharpen another. Now, where does that come from? That comes from Proverbs 27, verse 17. Where's Proverbs? Proverbs, of course, is in the Old Testament. You see, uh, a wise man listens to counsel is what, is what Proverbs says. There's another good example of the joy of the Old Testament and its relevance for us today. One of the greatest verses in the Bible that helps us to walk by faith is Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in Yahweh. Remember, Yahweh is personal, active, and covenant-keeping. Trust in the Lord, or Yahweh, with all your heart, and don't lean on your own understanding. Don't try to figure it all out. In all your ways, literally the Hebrew word is know him and he will make your paths straight. <clears throat> That's the Old Testament. How about Psalm 37 verses 3 and 6, 3 through 6. Trust in the Lord, trust in Yahweh. Remember, because he's personal, active, and he keeps covenant. That's the meaning of his name. Trust in Yahweh and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. 
or that Hebrew sentence can mean feed securely on his faithfulness. Delight yourself in Yahweh and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to him. Trust also in him and he will do it. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your reward as the noon day. That's the Old Testament. That's Psalms 37 verses 3 through 6. Another memory verse that I, I've quoted thousands of times comes from Isaiah 41, 8 through 10. You whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from its remotest parts and said to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not rejected you. Do not Fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That's Isaiah 41, 8 through 10, speaking about the joy of the Old Testament and its relevance for believers today. Amen. Psalm 119, verse 165. Those who love your Torah, teaching, instruction, have great peace and nothing causes them to stumble. Or Isaiah 26, 3 and 4. The steadfast of mind, that is the one who leans on the Lord, the steadfast of mind, you will keep in shalom, shalom, that is perfect peace, because he trusts in you. Trust in Yahweh forever. For in God the Lord we have an everlasting rock. Isn't that good? But there it is. There's the Old Testament, the joy and the relevance of the Old Testament for us. Amen? How about Exodus? One last one. Exodus 14, 12 through 14, when the, when the Israelites were right at the Red Sea, right up against the Red Sea, and the Egyptians were coming after them, and they were trapped. Two, three, four million Israelites and Moses stood and shouted. You can read it in Exodus 14, 12 through 14. Do not fear. The Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. And of course, God parted the Red Sea. The Israelites went through it on dry land. And then when the Egyptians came in after them, thinking that they would be able to follow right through them, the, the, um, the waters came over them and drowned them. As we mentioned last time, a picture of water baptism. You see the joy and the relevance of the Old Testament for today. Amen? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So most of the moral laws are still in effect insofar as we, as we see them mentioned or alluded to in the New Testament. Examples where they're no longer in effect would be stoning someone to death for rebellion against parents, for adultery, for murder, uh, for rape, those kinds of things. Now, there are laws in, in many nations that re re require or bring the death penalty uh, for some of these things, particularly for murder. Another example concerning civil laws was the, the law against 
boiling a young goat in its mother's milk. You can find that in Exodus 23, verses 18 and 19. One of the reasons for that law for the Israelites was that the Canaanites did just that for magic spells. They had some very weird practices. So God puts that law in Exodus because he doesn't want the people to act like the Canaanites. So tr two of the crowning legacies of Exodus are first the Passover, which we've gone over, but we'll go over again and again. And the Passover, of course, was given to the Israelites to remind them that they were God's people by grace and that through faith in the blood of the Lamb, they could have a right relationship with Him. The second extraordinary legacy for Israel and for the Gentiles would be the Ten Commandments, which we've already gone over. Again, these commandments made Israel a unique nation. Yet they also laid down the principles for how all peoples, uh, for all peoples, for all nations, in how God wants them to act and, and, and have their nations to be run religiously and in the civil domain. As a matter of fact, most of the laws in the United States of America were are rooted in the Ten Commandments and rooted in biblical law. Most of the laws uh, in our Constitution are that way. They, they were written into the English common law. And then when our founding fathers came over to the United States, they used the English common law and the commentaries by Blackstone and Coke, two great uh, English jurists and, and legal minds. Uh, and they referred to them as they set up laws in the United States of America. So again, the importance of each commandment that we read about can be seen in that they're all reinforced in the New Testament. That is the moral laws. The first four commandments of the Ten Commandments deal with man's relationship to God, while the next six commandments focus on man's relationship to man. So when our hearts are right first before the Lord, that helps us then to carry out His will to be His blessing to other people. There's the genius of the Ten Commandments. And of course, they're all summed up by Jesus in Matthew 22, verses 37 through 39. Let's pause there and we'll continue on uh, with our, our discussion about the tabernacle or the sanctuary. Let me pause there now so that I can take a break. <laughs> 